<laughs> That's yeah. Um, one hundred percent the opposite. Yeah. And I, I say that expression every time I talk about a book and people ask me how I came to put it together and I say I'm not a natural writer. And so it was actually the time where e zines were coming out, you know, email newsletters. And so I thought I'm not a natural writer. I can't imagine writing a book, so I'll write a tip each week for a year and then I'll just put them all into a book, which was – that was my first mistake um, <laughs> because that had no theme to it. It had no continuity or context. So that sort of took me backwards. But um, I was very – I'm always good at the big picture. I could see the framework and what I wanted to say and um, it just took me a little while to um, to put into print. But I think that's also – as an author, you you evolve with your book, and you'd find the same with you know your podcasts and what you write and your blogs. You sort of everything's about personal evolution, and so the book I think came out at the right time. Um, so um, I had a wife too, which was you know a bit like the universe testing you know the knowledge. And I was saying that the other day, you can have have the theories that might sound really good, but nature sometimes tests you about whether you're actually living them what you're preaching and so you know I had a wife that had breast cancer and um so that was a whole journey in terms of you know just stripping away what we probably shouldn't have been doing in terms of taking on stress in her job and life and and uh so yeah the whole journey was uh an interesting one I'll just rewind a second because I want to talk firstly on those two topics because I think they're really important. The first one is the how did you grow in those three years from writing the book? You know that that a not just the knowledge but the the discipline and the practice to continue to to sit down and, and write. Um, you know what was that like for you? Because that, that I'd imagine that's a skill set. A if you're not a natural writer and you haven't learnt that skill. That's something that's really got to be adopted and and brought into your day. Yeah, I'm a I'm an early morning person, so that was my ritual. That if I didn't do something on the book first thing in the morning, then I probably wouldn't do it. So that was my that became my daily practice, and I'm quite disciplined when I need to be. So it was early morning, do something on the book, and the and the whole idea was just to do something, whether it was actually, you know, you churn out a few pages or whether you just didn't feel like that one day and you went and researched, you know, something on the web or you just went for a walk and you made little notes as you go. It was just to do something and that idea of just one step after the other and eventually it, it turns out into a book. So, um, yeah, that was my that was my practice basically with with that and and once i got once i get everything down into the main chunks of a chapter i actually really love the process yeah and once the brain dump's been done and you've got the basic structure i loved it because you get then you can just refine it and you know get get case studies and add a few jokes in and it's sort of the nice nice part of it and i think mark that's what you're describing is that that it's that's the natural steps or probably the best steps to take when you actually want to make wellness change it's just mm -hmm. taking a step each day it's just continuing to do a little thing you might take a step back or not do as much on a certain day but it's it's the progress not the perfection absolutely couldn't agree more yeah um, so i think there's a lot you learn in your discipline whether it's at work or parenting or whatever it is that you can take and use those those skills in other elements and other parts of our life yeah yeah beautiful mate the, the second part of that was you described, and I think we'll, we'll catch up just by email a little bit that time when, when your wife did get cancer, like how hard or how did you manage that in terms of your living a really natural life and a natural, you're talking about it, how to do it, but then you get obviously met with that challenge and that adversity to actually almost meet your maker in a certain degree. Like what, how, did yeah. you get, how did you get through that? Uh, well, it was really, it was really difficult, um, for many reasons, I guess. Um, and there were so many variables and I always say, you know, people going through it, it's a personal journey. There's no one size fits all. Um, but I guess for us, the lesson to come out was that 
was was basically stress. And, you know, we hear about it all the time that, you know, stress is the biggest killer and da, da, da. But we actually don't live it, you know. And I was a perfect example, you know. Um, I'd written the book. I knew. And the first chapter of my book is all about emotional health, how it's from the Eastern perspective that's far more important than whether we have the perfect diet or we've got a six-pack or all that sort of stuff. Um, and she basically was in a in a working environment. I won't go into details, but just like really extreme stress. And that analogy of the frog in the hot water, you know, you put a yeah. frog in cold water, heat it up slowly, nothing happens, put it in hot water, jumps out. And so she'd been exposed to this really strong stress for years and basically didn't do anything about it. And then I came along and didn't either. You know, we sort of swept it under the carpet like most of us do in the West, we rationalize, you know, our stress is a part of life, stress is a part of the job. And so we sort of, in theory, we knew stress wasn't good, but we we didn't actually act on it. And so that's that was my big regret, you know. There was other sort of influences. Her family were very, very Western okay. orientated, you know, eat a steak at 9 o'clock at night to get your strength up sort of thing, which is fine everyone's their point of view so she was a little bit caught too you know she, in one sense she wanted to try and do natural ways and then she did obviously did the western she did chemo and radiation and eventually sort of um succumbed to the drugs in one sense so um but my big regret i guess and what i talk about now is just at the time years earlier when both of us really knew that the environment we were in and that sort of toxic um, effect of the stress, we didn't actually act on it. You know, we just yeah, rationalized yeah. it and took the easy way out, said, you know, stress is a part of life. And and so I think that's the, the thing I now try and put first that, you know, it's not about the perfect diet. It's not about having the perfect life. It's just having a simple, ideally, you know, less stress in our life before we worry about the other aspects of, uh, of well-being. Yeah, I, mate, and I think... One thing we undersell on that is we undersell the, the power of reflection and to sit down and re- reflect really, really well and learn to do it really well um, and to do it that aligns to our dharma or to our purpose and, and what gives us meaning and fulfillment and yeah. having a clear framework for how that looks. And if it doesn't look how we intend it to look and if we're actually off our path, we we have the the tools and the capability to, to step back onto our right path because we actually know exactly what that looks like and how important it is to us. So yeah. I think that that's something if, you know, I was going to give to anyone listening is you need, you need to reflect to renew, you know, to reflect, yeah. then you can renew the energy. Um, Beautiful. It's really important that we get that and actually get good at it, not just do it because we have to. Yeah. yeah. And that's, sorry to cut in, yeah, but yeah. that's, exactly what happened in the process and that's what I think everyone who goes through a life-threatening illness either directly or as a partner or as a family member or a relative it's basically nature's way of forcing us to reflect Mm -hmm. and realign because I tell now and I tell audiences I speak to um, her being diagnosed with breast cancer while it was the worst day of our life it was also the best and although it was a curse it was actually the greatest blessing both of us have ever got because it basically gave her an excuse to get out of that environment. And from that day on, she did reflect and I reflected and we had much better perspective on life and we got much closer to our dharma and doing things because we enjoyed them and felt purposeful about them rather than just doing them because other people wanted yep. them to do us. So I think if we don't hear the message in the first instance which is ideal then eventually nature you know gives us other opportunities to reflect and do exactly what you've uh, beautifully pointed out yeah. yeah i think it's it's voluntary or involuntary like it's like you either choose to reflect and and recover and and do it for yourself or or nature and your body's going to tell you that it's time and you're not going to get a choice yeah. and it's as simple as that you just don't know when it's coming yeah um, yeah nice mate so after that happened, you know, obviously, I want to just touch before we go into, you sort of went on to a journey because I can remember the time when I emailed and said, oh, what are you up to? And you're like, I'm going to do my TM teaching and I'm going for a few, mm. I think it was a few weeks, maybe six weeks or something, you were heading over to India. 
five months. Five months, sorry, yeah. Yeah. What can you explain that process then of, of how that takes place where you again you you it's I find it fascinating that you had the whole start of this conversation was a trip to Southeast Asia where you sort of really grew as a person from that and obviously the adversity comes and that that seems to be the the growth phase for you to go back and explore yourself more. Yeah, it was yeah, no, it's oh it's interesting actually to self reflect um on that again. But um so my wife had passed, she passed um oh, a bit over four years ago now and and the year after that the obviously leading up to that was a really tough time and um you were sort of fairly um, bound, you know, right by her and supporting her and caring for her in the last, you know, year particularly. And so the year following that, I actually traveled, you know, it was just to get away from things and try and rebalance. And, and I actually went to South Africa where I have some friends in Johannesburg and she's a Ayurvedic practitioner as well. And they're TM teachers and they won, run one of the most successful um, meditation centers in the world they teach thousands of people and and i remember we we're doing some ayurvedic seminars and i was sitting in the bathtub um that night and i just got this desire that you know it was time to become a, a tm teacher because i just i knew from my own experience that transcending we touched on earlier that ability to contact the deepest part of ourselves and enliven that Consciousness is really the most powerful thing we can do for our health because we can we can know consciously to eat certain foods and not others or to do certain exercise or to what our dharma is. But if there's stress in the system, then it's very hard for us to actually make that happen. And so that that experience that meditation that transcending just helps the whole process and it just it was just something that came that now's the time you know this is the greatest gift you can give people that ability to just transcend beyond all the stress and the craziness of life to that inner peace and contentment and that experience that we come out of that and we're just that little bit more clearer make better decisions a little bit friendlier and and uh life's good so yeah a few months later, I was uh, off to plan. It was actually in Holland. Um, five months, no phones, no computers. Had to stop work for five months and just dive right into uh, into it. But yeah, beautiful, really beautiful. What time. was it? What was that like? Like, what's the the first mu- first few weeks like? Obviously, you know, without devices. Like, how do you how do you navigate that? And you know, obviously, there's the the start of it. There's the middle, and then there's the knowing that it's ending soon, and that you've got to re position yourself back into society like how did, yeah. how, did, how did that play out in your mind well um i know you're a big one for um sort of digital detoxes and having time away from the technology so the first the first half of the course was absolutely amazing to not have the phone and the every day was brilliant because it just allowed you to immerse into the whole process, which we just don't get anymore, you know, and it was just, it was just all these worries from, you know, complications were just gone and you just had this beautiful knowledge, videotapes, and then experience, you know, you had long meditations morning and night, um, a great bunch of sort of people doing the course and it was just beautiful. And then the second half of the course, yeah, as it, coming out of that and closer to the course finishing yeah that's when the sort of the questions started to pop up about oh now what am I going to do and how am I going to sort of uh, integrate this into my life and uh, it was uh, it was really interesting sort of process and you would have and you would have been in a space to know notice the thoughts not buy into Mm. them but notice that this is interesting like that I'm having mm. this thought that I've got to reposition myself or what I'm going to do with the team teaching now that I've done yeah. it, all these stories that you would have told yourself. Yeah, yeah. And the other big thing was um, the routine. Um, leading up to the course, I was, you know, a lot of travel, different countries, you know, you're trying to get everything ready to go and um, get out of 